And welcome back to the Financially Simple Experience. In our last episode, we introduced a series, a series specifically designed for financial advisors. Now, my last episode, I gave the reason for that. There are so many financial advisors that reach out to me just about every day, business owners across the country who say, Justin, man, I need help. And since our recording of that introduction to this series, I had this epiphany. I was speaking to probably 25 or 30 uh, financial advisors over the last week, uh, various advisors across the country, just various locations, a, a, a number of different practice styles. And one thing became apparent to me. Every advisor who's sitting as a business owner in the advisor seat is simply trying to figure out how to experience, as I'm going to call it, the eight-figure exit, the eight-figure exit. They want to build a business in such a way they can enjoy life, they can be with their family, they can they can maximize their revenue for themselves, they can take care of their clients who, let's, let's be candid, many of our clients become our dearest friends. They want to take care of their team and they sacrifice so much. And they realize that because of the sacrifice, because of the J curve in the financial advisory business, they are behind their peers, their employee, their, their friends who are maybe employees in the in, in, in different businesses, they're behind them financially. And ultimately they're saying, hey, I've got this book here. I've got this business that's valuable. I wonder how I can maximize it. So we're going to put a, a, a title on this series that we're going to be in for some time now called The Eight Figure Exit. You say, Justin, I'm not a financial advisor. I understand that. The concepts that I'll be teaching throughout this series come from my own experience, come from my own personal business journey to the eight-figure exit. It comes from that particular movement for me personally. So I want to share with those, but if you're not a financial advisor, you can take these same methodologies and apply it to your business. This is what we teach other business owners around the country who are from various types of businesses, who run various types of, of industries in the service industry, in the retail industry, in the manufacturing industry. Business is simple, but oftentimes we as business owners get tied down and we often can't see the forest for the trees as the old saying goes. So today I want to start off, I mean, right out of the gates. I want to come out, you know, as they, in the boxing world, they're going to say, we're going to come out swinging today. We're going to start off with this simple question. Are you tired of feeling broke as a financial advisor? <laughs> Are you tired of feeling, feeling broke as a business owner? Now, let's put, some, let's put some skin on that bone. Let's put some meat on that bone. You know, whenever you hear the topic that says feeling broke, naturally our mind goes to financially. We're saying, holy cow, my, I, I'm in this business. It is killing me. I'm working 60, 70 hours, and I'm contemplating, is it even worth it? The grass looks greener on the other side. Maybe I should just get out of this business and go work for a company somewhere. So maybe you're saying financially, I feel broke. I watch my colleagues, my friends who work in corporate America and they're making more money than me and they seem like they can have their eight weeks paid vacation and they just they just are making a lot of money. Or we go to an industry event like the Financial Planning Association or some of the others that, that you and I may see each other at and they're saying, man, this advisor's on stage and he's talking about he works 10 hours a week and makes you know $250 million a year in revenue or some absurd number, right? How in the world? And here I am just doing everything I can and I feel financially broke. And yeah, that's, that's one type of brokenness. But maybe you're feeling broke as a financial advisor emotionally. Business wears us out. Business wears a business owner out. You've heard me say it many times. No one understands a business owner like another business owner, period. Maybe you're feeling broke emotionally. Maybe it's physically Maybe it's physically. I got to tell you, in the last year and a half since exiting my company and, and uh, going through my transition, I have been investing back into my own body, taking care of myself, and I feel so much better today. I feel strong. I feel vibrant. My, my blood pressure's moved in the right direction. All my labs look great. Now, tomorrow may be a different story, but today, just finishing up with a doctor, I feel great physically. You're saying, Justin, that's not me, man. I don't even have time to exercise. I don't have time to breathe. I've been there. I've been there. Maybe it's spiritually. Maybe your mind is so engaged in your business that you haven't had time to take care of your mental health, your spiritual health, you know, whatever that is for you. Maybe it's psychologically. Maybe you've got demons that you're fighting. I, as a business owner, I've been there. You lay awake at night in your bed and you fight the demons of all the what ifs. They keep you up at night and you're just psychologically 
tired. You're broke. Brokenness is a byproduct of our lack of pure data that we need as business owners to stay self-aware with reality. Let me say that again, because this is powerful here. Brokenness, emotionally, physically, financially, spiritually, psychologically, whatever it is for you as a business owner, brokenness is a byproduct of our lack of pure data that we need as business owners to stay self-aware with reality. Think about that statement. If we knew the data, then often we can, as my mom used to say, son, you would clean out a horse trough with a fondue fork if someone paid you enough. Think about it. You have the data there. If someone's willing to pay you $2 million to clean a horse trough out with a fondue fork, you have the data and you can be, you could be singing all the way whistling Dixie as the old saying goes, you know, this little light of mine, whatever it is, your song that you go to as a kid, you could be singing that as you're cleaning out the horse trough with a fondue fork because you have the data knowing that this mundane, ridiculous exercise has a payoff that is substantial. So oftentimes our brokenness is the fact that we don't have the data we need to stay self-aware with what's happening to keep us in check with reality. So today I want to walk through one element. I want to go through one specific element today, which is where I started. I, I can remember this years ago, friends. It was 2016. I remember like it was yesterday. I'm looking at my business. I had been in the industry for about 15 years at that point, give or take. And I'm going, this is ridiculous. This is ridiculous. Everything the quote recruiter told me years ago, is not here. I made so many mistakes, mistake after mistake after mistake. And I was at this point where I'm like, I'm done. My brain is too powerful. My mind, my drive is too powerful to continue to make this mundane amount of money and to be tired and broken. Remember, remember like it was yesterday. So I want to walk you through this journey to the eight figure exit that we're thinking about. I want to walk you through this journey on a number of different things through a number of different things. It's going to feel as we go through these conversations that I'm disjointed. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what the first step is, and we're going to talk through that. The next episode is going to feel a little disjointed, but the whole methodology is going to be, hey, can we get to an eight-figure exit? To me, to me, in order for me to move away from brokenness, I need to face toward contentment. I need to move away from this area of discontentment to contentment. So to me, contentment is a state of being where I feel energized, where I'm self-aware in the moment, where I'm fulfilling the purpose I have for my life, where I'm focused on a mission, where I'm at peace, where when things come up around me that it doesn't just cause me to go into a tizzy, that's to me contentment. It's whenever the whole house is, quote, burning down around you that you are calm, cool, and collected, and you know how to deal with it. That is contentment. On the opposite side of that brokenness, yeah, sure, I may be financially, I'm trying to figure out how to even take my kids to an amusement park or how am I going to get a vacation or trying to keep my mind safe from an emotionally or physically standpoint. So in order for us to move from brokenness, we have to move into a place of contentment. Now, how do we do that? We're financial advisors. Many of us are super analytical. Some of us are not. Some of financial advisors, many that I meet with, are sales-minded. Others of us are extremely analytical. So where I started was I wanted to know what the industry average was. I want to know where, where am I as a financial advisor today? Where's my business? And what is the industry average? So when I speak to financial advisors, business owners, financial advisors who are business owners across the country, and I speak to many, many, many of you every week, as I speak to you, I ought to find out that financial advisors fall into several different bands. But when my journey started, I was in, I was aspiring for the eight figure exit. And I was in this, let's say $250 million of AUM to $500 million of AUM. That's, that's an average number. And you may say, Justin, I'm nowhere near that. Maybe I only have a hundred million dollars of assets under management. Okay. We can work and aspire to still get to an eight figure exit. Maybe you're like, Justin, man, I have, I have a billion dollars of assets under managing our company, but, but I'm still not there. My numbers just don't look good. And that's possible friends. I spoke to somebody last week who had $1.2 billion in assets under management, but the rest of the financials of the company are just, just dismal. And it's not going to be the exit that they aspire to have. So we've got to begin looking at the average. 
There was a study done by Fidelity in the 2022 RIA benchmarking study that said for these businesses that have between $250 million of AUM up to about $500 million of AUM, that the average annual revenue is just over $1.8 million, is actually $1.883 million. So if we backwards extrapolate this, it means that if you're doing $250 million of AUM, that you're charging on average that's coming into your company after potentially your broker dealer gets their cut, the custodian gets their cut, all the different vendors get their cut. What actually goes into your bank account is about 0.8. Maybe it's a little higher depending on how you position your business. Maybe it's a little less depending on how you position your business. But on average, it's around about 0.8 if you're in that $250 million of assets under management range. Okay, so we have a starting point. Again, your business may be higher or lower. Your numbers may be just a little bit different. But we have a starting point for today's conversation. Now, what's interesting to me, whenever I look at the averages, is that these firms, again, keep in mind, one's doing about $1.8 million of revenue. This is the average based on the Fidelity RIA study. They spend on average 49% in direct expenses and 30% in indirect expenses. That's their cash flow. So we know how much money they're making. That's their top line revenue, 1.8 million. Now we know their cash flow, whether it be cost of goods or expenses, is, is sending out roughly 49% on direct and roughly 30, 30% on indirect. Now, what's interesting in the study is it doesn't give a pure definition for direct and ind indirect expenses. But if you look at the study and use some deductive reasoning, you can ascertain that direct expenses are the expenses which are directly tied to delivery of the product or service. So, for example, if you have a subscription to like a financial planning software, say Money Guy Pro or eMoney, that would be a direct expense. You have to have that software or a software like that in order to provide financial planning. At least it's assumed to have such. So, that would be a direct expense. An indirect expense are for those expenses that are not directly tied to a product or service. So, for example, rent. I mean, you could be a complete, a complete virtual advisor and not have rent. Therefore, you wouldn't have that indirect expense. So let's start at the beginning. First of all, how does your revenue relate to the averages within the industry? Are you above or below average? First question. Let's go to the second question. How, are you, how is your expenses rate, rate relating to that of the average in the industry? Are you greater than 49% on direct expenses? Are you less than? Are you greater than 30% on indirect expenses? Or are you less than? Whenever you look at the same study, the, the study shows that on average, EBOC, which is earnings before owner's compensation, was just over a million dollars. Actually, it's 1.167, which means that in most of these businesses, there is, there is roughly a 61% profit margin. Say, so, well, Justin, how is that possible, man? We just spent 30% on, on direct expenses and 49% on indirect. We've got a total outlay roughly right now of almost 80%. How are you now telling me that 61% is profit margin? Well, because some of those indirect expenses, no doubt, are your, is your compensation. So when we do another, another calculation that's often used whenever you're doing a M&A or M&A within, um, within the financial world is EBOC. So the average for this area is EBOC is about 61%. How are you doing so far? Is your EBOC at 61% or is it significantly lower? By the way, if it's at 61%, you need to make some strategic moves in your business because it's probably too high if you want to continue to go to the eight-figure exit, okay? But that's neither here nor there. We can have that discussion as we continue on. Further, what's interesting is, is those companies which had, which had embraced technology spend on average about 3.3% of revenue, not of, not of gross profits, of revenue on technology, Whenever I dive into the financial advisors' businesses, I'm consulting with financial advisors, I often see that their technology expense is extreme. It's extremely high on a percentage of revenue or it's extremely low on a percentage of revenue. I very seldom find some that fall within the industry averages, which gives us a lot of room for improvement. Aside from technology, the most expensive thing we deal with in the, in the, in the RA space is personnel, salaries. It is an enormous expense for us. Perhaps you have a TAMP. That could be a, an enormous expense for you. I mean, I've seen TAMPs charge as much as 0.25 on the, on the fees charged. Some advisors pass it through to clients, some do not. So that could be a significant expense. Compliance could be a major expense. Insurance, office space. These are some of the larger expense categories. Now, for each of these expenses, there are industry averages depending on which, where your revenue 
falls for your particular business. This is what we help business owners, financial advisors, as we coach them toward this eight-figure exit. These are the things that we want to look at. Now, what's interesting to me in a study done by Investment News, about the same time the Fidelity study was done, it showed that most financial advisors or most RIA owners underinvest in marketing. They spend about 1.2 to 1.9% of revenues. Whereas the same article illustrates that most firms who are rapidly growing, who are driving value, spend about 3 to 4% of gross revenue. Think about that. Are you spending anywhere between 3 to 4% of gross revenue? And if you are, is it paying the dividends you expect? Most of the advisors I speak with call me and they're saying, Justin, how in the world did you do what you did? How are you doing what you're doing now for my colleague, for my friend over here? I'm hearing these unbelievable stories from you and from others about how basic value acceleration works for the financial industry. How do you do it? And when you dive into the numbers, marketing is one of those things that we often see is just so far underutilized. So the first step in, in feeling not broke, so to speak, is to know what the average in the marketplace is. How are you doing so far? Man, Justin, I, I, you lost me. Then you need some help. Because step two in this process is you've got to identify the problem. Once you identify what the industry requires and you overlay your particular business on top of it, you've got to identify the problem. Is the problem lack of priority? Hey, marketing is just not a priority for me. That's where we just concluded in this first segment. Marketing is not a priority for me. Therefore, I don't spend there. Well, that could be a problem. Maybe it's emphasis. Maybe it's you're focusing on the wrong thing. Maybe it's you're not managing the business at all. Maybe it's you you found yourself as Michael Gerber's famous book, E-Myth, as Sarah, the baker of pies. Maybe you find yourself, hey, I really want to be a financial advisor and not a business owner. This business side of things for me just is awful. Maybe that's where you find your your place. Maybe you don't have the right financial controls in place. And that's where I want to dive into a little deeper today, because there could be a myriad of problems. We're going to identify multiple problems throughout this entire series on trying to seek for that eight-figure exit, okay? But today I want to dive into financial controls, because to me it's amazing. It's amazing when I start asking financial advisors, hey, what is your current run rate? in terms of profit. Hey, what is your current valuation? How much did your company's share price, stock price, membership units price, how much did it increase over the last quarter? And I hear crickets literally on the other side of the phone. I I don't know. I don't know. In the book, The Success System That Never Fails, written by Clement Stone, W. Clement Stone, he makes this quote, which is, oh, so important for us. You cannot expect what you don't inspect. Think about that. If we expect high profits, then are we inspecting to see, are we yielding high profits? If we expect employee loyalty, then are we inspecting to make sure that we're driving the things that demand employee loyalty? If we're expecting an influx of new clientele while having the back door closed, then are we inspecting the true KPIs to determine if we have the right marketing in place to drive the inflows? You cannot expect what you don't inspect. So let's let's take a breather and let's look at where we're at in this journey. We feel broke for a number of reasons. Maybe it's financially, spiritually, emotionally, physical, whatever it is, you feel broke. We now know where the average is. And I gave you one bellwether of average for a particular segment within the financial advisory space. Again, you may have more revenues or less revenues, more asset center management or less asset center management. You may be a fee-only advisor versus a non-fee-only advisor. Nonetheless, there is a bellwether of where you should be as an average. We've now examined, hey, we've got to identify the problem. What is, what's causing the problem? Is it because we have a lack of priority, lack of emphasis, because we don't have today's episode, the right financial controls in place? What do we do about it? Man, this is what I love here, friends. I, this stuff drives, this, this excites me. This excites me to walk you through this because the next step is, is we got to create a plan to align us with the industry. You're like, Justin, I don't want to be the average of the industry. I want to go out and do my own thing. I, I get that. I get that. And this is, sounds funny. When I wrote this sentence out, my team started laughing at me. They said, I hope this is a sound clip. Please don't make this a sound clip, team. But this is funny to me. Before you can begin customizing, 
before you can say, hey, I want an eight-figure exit, or hey, I want this lifestyle practice where I only have to work X number of hours per month, per week, per quarter, and I can have X number of revenue. Before you can get there, you have to at least be average. <laughs> you have to at least be average. <laughs> before you can become a superstar, you have to make the, the sports team. Before you become best in class, you have to at least be in the class. You can't be, you cannot be somebody who's still out here playing the game without having any type of baseline. So you need to at least be average. That was the clip they were laughing at. But if you put it in context, friends, I hope you get what I'm trying to say. Whenever we're dealing with the business, for us as financial advisors, and for many business owners, mind you, we want to look at the expenses. We want to look at the cash flow. We want to look at the revenue. We want to know the financial controls. So here we go. You have to create a plan that aligns you with the industry that uh, provides you a monthly expense review. Monthly expense review. I can remember 16, I had somebody, some in person in the company keep keeping the finances and I'm running 70 hours a week, meeting with clients, running the compliance systems, building the financial plans, doing all those things, had the, uh, the, the staffing team doing the paperwork, trying to keep up with everything. It didn't have any systems in place. And then I would get this, get this report. I would get this, this number written on a sheet of paper and the numbers were like, I'm tired. The income wasn't matching the output that I was putting out. I can remember the day when I decided, okay, I'm going to hire an external CPA firm, a CFO, so to speak, to do my work, my CFO work. I'm going to hire somebody externally that can pay the bills, that can reconcile the accounts, that can tell me, give me parameters, KPIs within the financial metrics on a monthly basis. I'm going to hire somebody because I want to know in real time how I'm doing. I think it's laughable. I do. I think it's so funny. Whenever I talk with business owners and I ask a question, a simple question like this. Hey, did your gross profit increase last month over the previous month? Well, I, I don't know. Or did you increase any expenses last month as a one time over the previous month or over the run rate? I, I don't know. I think it's laughable. Now, why do I say it's laughable? Because as a business owner, if you don't know the exact results of your most recent activities, and month by month on a calendar basis makes a lot of sense for many people, if you don't know the results from last month's activities, then how do you make proper adjustments in the moment? If you don't have the proper data, then how are you in the moment making real-time adjustments for your business? I'll tell you what you're doing. For those of you watching me on YouTube, here's what I'm doing. What I did, friends, is I just licked my finger and I stuck it up in the air. In other words, like the old farmers used to do, they lick their finger try to figure out which way the wind's blowing. It was a crude way, but they're really just guessing at the moment. The reality is, is the wind could be swirling in that moment, but that's not the major direction. Trust me, I've set a lot of fires in my life in the country. You start a fire, you think the smoke's going to go one way, and it just happened to be a, just a wind swirl at that moment, and the fire gets going and it blows the smoke right into the house. The very way I didn't want it to go, and it ended up blowing it into the house for all day long. <laughs> Not good. So the reality is, is that if we don't have the data in the moment, then we're really just flying by the seat of our pants, as the old adage says. We're running off of feelings versus true data. The 2021 Fidelity RA benchmark study revealed that 40% of advisors outsource their accounting and fee billing. First of all, let me tell you, congratulations for the 40 that do that. And because what happens is for the 60% of you who don't, because you don't trust somebody or whatever the reason is, those advisors who outsource report higher growth, higher compensation, and fewer clients per advisors. That's the result. So the very first thing that you need to do if you're trying to break this feeling of brokenness is you need to create a plan that aligns with the industry. And one of the things you're going to do is start looking at your financial data of your company every single month. I recommend outsourcing, outsourcing to a CPA firm, hire a stay-at-home CPA. In fact, that's who I hired. We had a client who was a stay-at-home CPA. She was a mom and was raising her family and I trusted her. And she did my books for almost 15 years. 
She took care of payroll. She took care of paying the bills. Yeah, it cost me some money, but I was confident because I trusted her. She trusted me that the financials were accurate. So number one is, is you want to get up-to-date financials. The second thing is, is you have to have a defined process and defined procedures. What do I mean? You have to have a way to determine the effectiveness or the ROI of the expenses that you're pushing out. So let's say, for example, that we're going to invest some money into marketing because that's one of the topics I hit on earlier. Let's say we're going to invest some money in marketing. How many times did you pour money into marketing because somebody called you and said, hey, we're going to put you as an ad here. You spend the two, three, four, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, whatever it is, and you're like, man, I didn't get any clients from that. What a waste of money. Reality is, is that you didn't have a way to determine the effectiveness of the investment. See, when you build defined processes within the company, then what transpires is, is you're able to allow your operations department or your operations people to confirm the very existence of your financials. You're able to confirm the results they're in. So the second thing is, is you've got to have a process in place. I can remember building processes in my company. Oh, laborious. It never stops, by the way, when it comes to processes. But by defining processes and procedures, it allowed the finance department to connect with the operations department, which ultimately became a, a spider web of connections across the company. So starting point number one is you, is you get true data. The next step is you begin defining processes and procedures. And then finally, you begin forecasting. So once I had true data and then I could see, okay, here are the processes I need to develop within the company in order to drive the true data where I want it to be, then I'm going to project of where do I expect my company to be. So I'll use this methodology called a performa. I love a performa. In fact, if you go to financialsimple.com and just type in performa in the search engine, you're going to see how many times I've talked about performas. To me, they're magical. A most, the most amazing thing happened whenever I began doing this process as I'm outlaying for you. I sat down the first time I had true financial data. It took me about six months to a year to get all accurate, but I had true data on the company from its beginning to currency. And it was, it was done right. The CPA had assured it was done right. And it was, I began building processes to try to fill in the holes within the data. Then I took the data and overlaid it into a performance and I projected where I wanted my company to be for me to have an eight figure exit. So I began projecting that out. That was in 2016. Let's fast forward 46 months, 46 months worth of data. I missed my projection by roughly $30,000. 46 months earlier, I projected exactly where my NOI was going to be and what my value of the company should be. And I put together a plan using the performer to meet said objection. I was able to work within the planning of the company to facilitate a directional change. Have you ever done that? Have you ever sat back at pure data, figured out where the holes are, then projected where you're going to be, and then build a plan to get you to where you want to be? Friends, I took a company in 48 months and reached my dreams. 48 months. Yet some of us have been in the financial world for decades plus, and we're nowhere near the dreams. I remind you of a question that one of my dear friends asked me. They said, hey, Justin, if you had unlimited time and unlimited resources, what would you do tomorrow that you're not doing today? And at the time I could think, oh, man, I'd take care of my body. I would travel. I'd spend more time with my wife. I would give to charity. I'd be involved more in charity. I can remember this journey that I was on. So what is the results? What are the results of implementing financial controls? <laughs> this is so cool, friends. Whenever I began implementing financial control, I had cash flow maintenance. I knew exactly what was expected to come in and what was expected to go out, and I could make decisions in the moment to drive the company toward the desired outcome. In the moment, I had real data that I could choose, and this month I want to invest more in the company. In this month, you know what? I want to take my family on vacation. I'm going to take more money out of the company. In this month, I want to maximize my HSA. In this month, I want to, and the list could continue at nauseum here. It could continue on and on. By having the financial controls, I was able to look at my cash flow and then make decisions, plan decisions to drive the efficiency of my company. The second thing is, is it allowed my profitability to increase. By knowing what I was spending, my profitability in the company increased. We see it all the time with clients. We ask them, hey, how much are you spending at home? And they're like, I don't, I don't know. 
You know, they make up this thing and he's trying to backwards engineer and he's like, oh yeah, we spend about 10,000, 12,000, 100,000 a month, whatever the number is. And then we start getting the financial statements in order. We're like, dude, it's not 10,000. You're spending $17,286. Huh? What? Huh? No, there's no way. And we start showing him and goes, oh crap. I love Dave Ramsey's statement that he made. I heard him speak one time and um, he's been a hero of mine for years. And again, we could argue a lot of things he does and doesn't do just like you can argue with a lot of things I do and vice versa. But he made this statement. He said, Hey, every dollar is a soldier. You got to deploy your soldiers to win the battle. And the battle is as business owners is, is as I mentioned at the beginning of the show, profitability, efficiency, net worth. So by leveraging financial controls, you now see profitability increase. You now see revenue. Another thing that happens is you prevent fraud. I cannot tell you how many times I ask a business owner, financial advisor business owner, mind you, dude, why are you doing your own books? Well, who am I going to have to do them? I don't trust them. Why don't you trust them? Well, once upon a time, somebody stole from me. Really? Really? 40% of financial advisors outsource their, their books. It's been proving you increase profitability, but yet 60% don't. Look, if you implement financial controls, you can prevent fraud or you can minimize fraud drastically for that matter. You may not totally prevent it, but you can do your best to minimize just like every other area of life. Another result of implementing financial controls is you increase your compensation. You make more money. <laughs> you make more money and you feel good about the fact that I'm not going to take home a check today. Instead, I'm going to reinvest these dollars into the company and I have financial processes in place to let me know the hurdle rate is met. Let me know if my cost of capital is met. Let me know if, the, if it was a good investment within my company based on share price. You now have clarity of mind and you don't feel guilty about not taking money out of the company or taking money out of the company. You don't feel guilty about saying, hey, I'm going to go two weeks up and I'm going to go hunting or I'm going to go fishing or I'm going to go on this golf journey or I'm going to go to, to an exotic location for a month. And I'm taking off work. You don't feel guilty about that because you have right financial controls. And finally, by implementing financial controls, you are able to strategically and tactically deploy resources for strategic growth. I was illustrating this morning to a client and to a, an advisor. They want to reach a certain goal in their, in their business and their financial life. And they had the resources to either pull money out of the company and invest it, let's say, in a qualified plan or into other assets like real estate, for example, or they can deploy the money back into their business. And as we look at the, the, the return on investment of each of these type of markets that they would go into, we quickly determined that they could make greater return on their investment because nothing is guaranteed. We all know that, but they could make a greater return on their investment by deploying the cash back into the company. They were projected to have about a 62% ROI on that resource. That is a strategic move, but they were not able to make that determination until they had the proper financial controls put in place. So that's a lot of information and that's the depth of information we're going to dive into throughout this series. Because look, friends, as financial advisors, we have so many clients that look up to us saying, hey, are you doing what you're telling me to do? One of the most powerful tools, and I'll leave you with this, one of the most powerful tools that I've used in my arsenal to persuade people to trust me is I show them my stuff. I show them my life. Back in the day when I had people who were shopping me, what I would say is, I'll tell you what, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to show you how much money I make, how much my net worth is. I'm going to show you my business financials. I'll show them to you. Whoever else you're interviewing, ask to see their financials. See if they're going to practice what they preach. And today, many, many, many of my clients have been on this journey as we share together on this journey, as we challenge each other. And they've seen that, hey, oh, good bread, a country boy from Georgia. We underestimated this guy. He truly knows what he's talking about. Look at his exit. Look at where he's at today financially. And then I can say, hey, man, look at the success that you've had. So how about you? As a financial advisor, are you on track for an eight-figure exit? If not, dude, reach out. Go to Financially Simple. Reach out to me through social media, LinkedIn, whatever. I'd love to have a conversation with you personally. We have a coaching program that we can help. We can help you. We've done this. There's been many of my colleagues that have done this. We know how to grow successful financial advisory practices. If you need help, reach out to us. 
Maybe you're not a financial advisor. You've stayed with me throughout this entire episode. Hey, friends, how are your financial controls in your business? Do you need help? Man, I have a group of colleagues who work with business owners of every different discipline all over the country who can help you get your life in order so that you too can reach the expectations or the desires of your heart. Friends, until next time in this journey of the eight-figure exit, we're trying to do this. Until next time, friends, y'all go out and make it a great day.